guide oneself on the limits of sexual autonomy by Judith Butler. And she writes about loss and grieving. So she writes, I'm not sure I know when mourning is successful or when one has fully mourned another human being. I am certain, though, that it does not mean that one has forgotten the person or that something else come, comes along to take his or her place. I don't think it works like that. I think instead that one mourns when one accepts the fact that the loss one undergoes will be the one that changes you, changes you possibly forever. And that mourning has to do with agreeing to undergo a transformation, the fullest result of which you cannot know in advance. So there is losing, and there is the transformative effect of loss. And this latter cannot be charted or planned. I don't think, for instance, you can invoke a Protestant ethic when it comes to loss. You can't say, oh, I'll go through loss this way and that will be the result and I'll apply myself to the task and I'll endeavor to achieve the resolution of grief that is before me. I think one is hit by waves and that one starts out the day with an aim, a project, a plan, and one finds oneself foiled. One finds oneself fallen. One is exhausted but does not know why. Something is larger than one's own deliberate plan or project, larger than one's own knowing. Something takes hold, but is this something coming from the self, from the outside, or from some region where the difference between the two is indeterminable? What is it that claims us at such moments, such that we are not the masters of ourselves? To what are we tied, and by what are we seized? It may seem that one is undergoing something temporary, but it could be that in this experience, something about who we are is revealed, something that delineates the ties that we have to others, that shows us that those ties constitute a sense of self, compose who we are, and that when we lose them, we lose our composure in some fundamental sense. We do not know who we are or what to do. Many people think that grief is privatizing, that it returns us to a solitary situation, but I think it exposes the constitutive sociality of the self, a basis for thinking a political community of a complex order. It is not just that I might be said to have these relations, or that I might sit back and view them at a distance, enumerating them, explaining what this friendship means, what that lover meant or means to me. On the contrary, grief displays the ways in which we are in thrall of our relationships with others that we cannot always recount or explain, that often interrupts the self-conscious account of ourselves we might try to provide in ways that challenge the very notion of ourselves as autonomous and in control. I might try to tell a story about what I'm feeling, but it would have to be a story in which the very I who seeks to tell the story is stopped in the midst of the telling. The very I is called into question by its relation to the one to whom I address myself. This relation to the other does not precisely ruin my story or reduce me to speechlessness, but it does invariably clutter my speech with signs of its undoing. Let's face it, we're undone by each other, and if we're not, we're missing something. If this seems so clearly the case with grief, it is only because it was already the case with desire. One does not always stay intact. It may be that one wants to or does, but it may also be that despite one's best efforts, one is undone in the face of the other, by the touch, by the scent, by the feel, by the prospect of the touch, by the memory of the feel. Is there something to be gained from grieving, from tarrying with grief, remaining exposed to its apparent tolerability, and not endeavoring to seek a resolution for grief through violence? If we stay with a sense of loss, are we left feeling only passive and powerless as some fear? Or are we, rather, returned to a sense of human vulnerability, to our collective responsibility for the physical lives of one another? The attempt to foreclose that vulnerability, to banish it, to make ourselves secure at the expense of every other human consideration is surely also to eradicate one of the most important resources from which we must take our bearings and find our way. There is a more general conception of the human at work here, one in which we are, from the start, given over to the other. One in which we are, from the start, even prior to individuation itself, and by virtue of our embodiment, given over to another. This makes us vulnerable to violence, but also to another range of touch, a range that includes the eradication of our being 